ladies and gentlemen, former President and Mrs. George Bush, and Mrs. Jenna Walsh, accompanied by the daughters of the President-elect, Jenna and Barbara Bush.
Ladies and gentlemen, the President-elect of the United States, George Walker Bush, accompanied by Senator Mitch McConnell, Senator Christopher Dodd, Speaker J. Dennis Hester, Senator Trent Lott, Representative Richard Army, Representative Richard Gephardt, Jim Ziegler, Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, Bill Livingood, House Sergeant-at-Arms, and Tamara Somerville, Chief of Staff, Joint Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremony.
Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremonies, the Honorable Mitch McConnell. Everyone, please be seated so we can begin. Welcome to the 54th inauguration of the President and Vice President of the United States of America. Today we honor the past in commemorating two centuries of inaugurations in Washington, D.C. As well, we embrace the future, this day marking the first inauguration of the 21st century and the new millennium. America has now spanned four centuries, her promise still shining bright the beginning and present linked by timeless ideals and faith. The enduring strength of our Constitution, which brings us to the west front of the Capitol today, attests to the wisdom of America's founders and the heroism of generations of Americans who fought wars and toiled in peace to preserve this legacy of liberty. In becoming the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush will assume the sacred trust as guardian of our Constitution. Dick Cheney will be sworn in as our new Vice President. Witnessed by the Congress, Supreme Court, governors, and presidents past, the current President will stand by as the new President peacefully takes office. This is a triumph of our democratic republic, a ceremony befitting a great nation. In his father's stead, the Reverend Franklin Graham is with us today to lead the nation in prayer. Please stand for the invocation. Reverend Graham. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. Yours, O God, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power, power to, to exalt, exalt and to give strength to all. As President Lincoln once said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended powers, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. O oh Lord, as we come together on this historic and solemn occasion to inaugurate once again a president and vice president, teach us afresh that power, wisdom, and salvation come only from your hand. We pray, O oh Lord, for President-elect George W. Bush and Vice President-elect Richard B. Cheney, to whom you have entrusted leadership of this nation at this moment in history. We pray that you will help them bring our country together so that we may rise above partisan politics and seek the larger vision of your will for our nation Use them to bring reconciliation between the races, healing to political wounds, that we may truly become one nation under God. Give our new president and all who advise him calmness in the face of storms, encouragement in the face of frustration, and humility in the face of success. Give them the wisdom to know and to do what is right and the courage to say no to all that is contrary to your statutes and holy law. Lord, we pray for their families and especially their wives, Laura Bush and Lynn Cheney, that they may sense your presence and know your love. Today, we entrust to you, President and Senator Clinton, and Vice President and Mrs. Gore. Lead them as they journey through new doors of opportunity to serve others. Now, O oh Lord, we dedicate this presidential inaugural ceremony to you. May this be the beginning of a new dawn for America as we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge you alone as our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. We pray this in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Graham. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the DuPont Manual Choir of Louisville, Kentucky. Christopher J. Dodd of Connecticut to introduce the Chief Justice of the United States. Okay. Thank you, Senator McConnell, President and Senator Clinton, Vice President and Mrs. Gore, President-elect and Mrs. Bush, and fellow citizens. The Vice President-elect will now take the oath of office. His wife, Lynn, and their daughters Elizabeth Cheney Perry and Mary Cheney will hold the family Bible. I have the honor and privilege 
to now present the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable William Hobbs Rehnquist, to administer the oath of office to the Vice President-elect Richard Bruce Cheney. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Alec T. Molly of the United States Army Band will now perform an American medley.
It is now my high honor to again present uh, the Chief Justice of the United States who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, George W. Bush. Chief Justice Rehnquist, President Carter, President Bush, <laughs> President Clinton, distinguished guests and my fellow citizens. The peaceful transfer of authority is rare in history, yet common in our country. With a simple oath, we affirm old traditions and make new beginnings. As I begin, I thank President Clinton for his service to our nation. And I thank Vice President Gore for a contest conducted with spirit and ended with grace. I am honored and humbled to stand here where so many of America's leaders have come before me, and so many will follow. We have a place, all of us, in a long story, a story we continue, but whose end we will not see. It is a story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old. The story of a slave-holding society that became a servant of freedom. The story of a power that went into the world to protect but not possess, to defend but not to conquer. It is the American story, a story of flawed and fallible people united across the generations by grand and enduring ideals. The grandest of these ideals is an unfolding American promise that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, 
that no insignificant person was ever born. Americans are called to enact this promise in our lives and in our laws. And though our nation has sometimes halted and sometimes delayed, we must follow no other course. Through much of the last century, America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And even after nearly 225 years, we have a long way yet to travel. While many of our citizens prosper, others doubt the promise, even the justice of our own country. The ambitions of some Americans are limited by failing schools and hidden prejudice and the circumstances of their birth. And sometimes our differences run so deep, it seems we share a continent, but not a country. We do not accept this and we will not allow it. Our unity, our union, is the serious work of leaders and citizens in every generation. And this is my solemn pledge. I will work to build a single nation of justice and opportunity. I know this was in our reach because we are guided by a power larger than ourselves who creates us equal in his image. And we are confident in principles that unite and lead us onward. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. Today, today we affirm a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. America at its best matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing, and forgiveness. Some seem to believe that our politics can afford to be petty because in a time of peace, the stakes of our debates appear small. But the stakes for America are never small. If our country does not lead the cause of freedom, it will not be led. If we do not turn the hearts of children toward knowledge and character, we will lose their gifts and undermine their idealism. If we permit our economy to drift and decline, the vulnerable will suffer most. We must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. And this commitment, if we keep it, is a way to shared accomplishment. America at its best is also courageous. Our national courage has been clear in times of depression and war when defeating common dangers defined our common good. Now we must choose if the example of our fathers and mothers will inspire us or condemn us. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. Together we will reclaim America's schools before ignorance and apathy claim more young lives. We will reform Social Security and Medicare 
sparing our children from struggles we have the power to prevent. And we'll reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy and reward the effort and enterprise of working Americans. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. We will confront weapons of mass destruction so that a new century is spared new horrors. The enemies of liberty in our country should make no mistake. America remains engaged in the world by history and by choice, shaping a balance of power that favors freedom. We will defend our allies and our interests. We will show purpose without arrogance. We will meet aggression and bad faith with resolve and strength. And to all nations, we will speak for the values that gave our nation birth. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. <laughs> Government has great responsibilities for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep, they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque lend our communities their humanity, and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. Many in our country do not know the pain of poverty but we can listen to those who do. And I can pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Encouraging responsibility is not a search for scapegoats. It is a call to conscience. And though it requires sacrifice, it brings a deeper fulfillment. We find the fullness of life, not only in options, but in commitments. And we find that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Our public interest depends on private character on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency, which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life we're called to do great things, but as a saint of our times has said, every day we are called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. I will live and lead by these principles to advance my convictions with civility, to pursue the public interest with courage, to speak for greater justice and compassion, to call for responsibility and try to live it as well. In all these days, ways, I will bring the values of our history to the care of our times. What you do is as important as anything government does. 
I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort, to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens not spectators, citizens not subjects, responsible citizens building communities of service and a nation of character. Americans are generous and strong and decent, not because we believe in ourselves, but because we hold beliefs beyond ourselves. When this spirit of citizenship is missing, no government program can replace it. When this spirit is present, no wrong can stand against it. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, we know the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate, but the themes of this day he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today to make our country more just and generous, to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues, the story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God bless you all, and God bless America. Please stand now as Pastor Kirby John H. Caldwell will now deliver the benediction. And afterward, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem, after which the ceremony will be concluded. I call upon Senator Dodd to organize the presidential party after the ceremony has ended to depart the platform. Pastor Caldwell. Thank you, Senator McConnell. Let us pray, please. Almighty God, the supply and supplier of peace, prudent policy, and nonpartisanship, we bless your holy and righteous name. Thank you, O oh God, for blessing us with forgiveness, with faith, and with favor. Forgive us for choosing pride over purpose. Forgive us for choosing popularity over principles. And forgive us for choosing materialism over morals. Deliver us from these and all other evils and cast our sins into your sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. And Lord, not only do we thank you for our forgiveness, we thank you for faith faith to believe that every child can learn and no child will be left behind and no youth will be left out. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that all of your leaders can sit down and reason with one another so that each American is blessed. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that the walls of inequity can be torn down and the gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, 
the uneducated and the educated can and will be closed. And Lord, lastly, we thank you for favor. We thank you for your divine favor. Let your favor be upon President Clinton and the outgoing administration. May they go forth in spiritual grace and civic greatness. And of course, O oh Lord, let your divine favor be upon President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Welch Bush and their family. We decree and declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Let your divine favor be upon the Bush team and all Americans. With the rising of the sun and the going down of the same, may we grow in our willingness and ability to bless you and bless one another. We respectfully submit this humble prayer in the name that's above all other names, Jesus the Christ. Let all who agree say amen.
Take care of yourself. Man. Yeah. <laughs> 